I'm John Bradshaw. I'm David Sargon. And we're here to introduce you to the U4 website on genetic problems in companion animals. We're going to talk about uh, particular examples of diseases and how they are inherited. The health and welfare of dogs in the West has never been better than it is today. Um, modern advances in veterinary medicine have basically caused the eradication, or at least much of the prevention, of many of the diseases and conditions that used to plague dogs, such as, for example, parvovirus and distemper. But at the same time, we've seen a new challenge to dog welfare, and that's been the, what the breeders call line breeding, or what geneticists call inbreeding, of pedigree dogs. And that's caused a couple of different kinds of problems, although they're related. One is that the line breeding or inbreeding within any pedigree breed will cause the emergence of dangerous uh, mutations which begin, begin to affect quite a large proportion of the dogs in that breed. That can happen in any breed. Uh, and the second one is that in many of the breeds with extreme body shapes or sizes, specific diseases and conditions that are unique more or less to that particular breed emerge and come to dominate the welfare of that particular uh, type of animal. Now, David, can you tell me a little bit more about, say, the first kind, the, the emergence of these mutations? The sort of problems that we're talking about are inherited diseases, clearly, and they include uh, perhaps about 400 diseases that we know of in, in dogs, uh, each of which is uh, controlled by a single gene, a single bit of the DNA. Uh, we can find uh, those problems, and we find that they cause things like blindness, in inherited forms of blindness. Uh, they can cause problems with metabolism, so that particular dogs may not be able to uh, ingest and uh, metabolize particular nutrients. Uh, they can cause uh, uh, diseases such as ep epilepsy, neurological disease, and um, they can cause a whole spectrum of other conditions. Can we get some idea of the kind of scope of this problem? Do you have a, a rough idea of what proportion of pedigree dogs are affected by these, these, uh, these mutations? In general, we're talking about one or two percent of dogs actually being affected by the disease. But the problem is that actually there are more than one of these diseases in most breeds. And so perhaps about 10 percent of dogs may suffer some load based on these diseases, that's to say some uh, additional welfare burden, health burden, based on the disease. Yeah. And it's true, isn't it, that, for example, pedigree dogs as a whole are much more susceptible to death from cancer than crossbred dogs. Why are these mutations appearing and having such a profound effect on welfare uh, in pedigree dogs and not in uh, the ordinary mongrel dogs? So w when we look at uh, a pedigree dog as opposed to a mongrel dog or a mixed breed dog, um, the pedigree dog is going to have parents uh, that were the same type of dog, and they in their turn had parents that were the same type of dog. And what you have is a small part segment of the whole dog population that are breeding together and not breeding with any other type of dog. What that does is isolate the genes in that part of the population, in that pedigree breed. And by doing that, you give much more opportunity for bad genes to get together. And that's why we see higher rates of this disease in the pedigree dogs, uh, each breed having its own set of problems, different from, from other pedigree breeds. For example, I've heard a, a statistic that says that within a particular breed, a single breed, um, the, all the individuals are as closely related as, as human first cousins are. I mean, is that a reasonable approximation? Uh, it does depend a little bit on the breed, but yes it is, um, particularly for the breeds with, where there are smaller numbers of registered animals. Uh, that's a, a, quite a reasonable approximation. Uh, in fact, there is some data out there that says when you look at the molecular level, they're even a bit closer than first cousins. And that does give rise uh, to these sorts of problems. What one gets then is a group of dogs which are much more genetically similar to each other than they are to other breeds or to mixed um, breed dogs. David, can we now turn to the second of the problems that um, line breeding and inbreeding has caused within pedigree breeds? And that's much more specific to individual breeds. It's the breeding for a very specific and quite extreme types of body shape and size and that sort of thing. So this is a particular problem for dogs which are 
more different, if you like, from the standard doe mutt that you might see in the, the street uh, than others. And by that I mean dogs which are tiny, dogs which are giant, uh, dogs which have very short faces, um, perhaps dogs which have short legs but are, are normal body length and do dogs which have exaggerated uh, body lengths or body shapes. Uh, but people aren't deliberately uh, taking problems along with these strange conformations. It's just that they do occur because people are only thinking about the shape of their dog and not thinking about the health of their dog. And so the sort of things that one sees are, for instance, hip dysplasia, if you have a, a very dropped back in, for, say, a German Shepherd dog for the show ring. And these uh, cause quite well-known uh, problems in those breeds. The long back of the, the Dachshund often causes uh, disc disease. Um, so these are all examples. And the one I've been working on most recently is uh, a disease called, by the scientists, brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. Okay, what, can we have that in a simple Yeah, what that means, <laughs> terms, okay. yeah. so John, what that means is uh, the uh, difficulty that short-faced dogs have with breathe, breathing. Mm. And I guess many of you will be familiar with the idea that you see a bulldog walking up the street and very often its tongue is lolling out of its open mouth just as it keeps up with its owners uh, walking along. In other words, it's having to pant, it's having to breathe through its mouth. Now that's a bit of a problem. It restricts the dog in terms of uh, its ability to exercise normally. And actually it's a very big problem on hot days uh, when the dog is liable to uh, collapse because dogs do much of their cooling through panting through their mouths. If they can't do that efficiently, which these dogs can't, um, then uh, they start to overheat and that can kill the dog quite quickly. So this is a real uh, problem, not just for bulldogs, but for all of the short-faced breeds. Now we mustn't, um, mustn't pick on bull just, just the bulldogs because of course the problems go much wider than that. One of the ones that's received uh, an enormous amount of publicity are the Cavalier King Charles Spaniels and the problems they have with their skulls, which is, which is a quite different problem. Indeed, yes. So the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel suffers uh, from a disease called syringomyelia, a long name, meaning that the dog um, accumulates uh, voids within its spinal column that shouldn't be there. It accumulates areas where the uh, tissue of the spinal cord is torn open and there's a gap uh, within the spinal cord. And that uh, appears to be to do again with the head shape. Uh, Cavalier King Charles have a, a very domed head and uh, it's also um, it's shortened front to back rather than up and down. And what that seems to do uh, is to produce uh, an animal where the brain case is too small for the brain. And the brain exudes a little bit into uh, the normal positions for the top of the spinal cord. And that causes um, changes in the way uh, fluid which lubricates the whole system, known as cerebral spinal fluid, uh, is able to transfer along the spinal cord and it's this problem which creates pressure changes in the spinal cord and causes these voids. That's the the science you're I'm sure wanting to know but what's the disease? Well, yes well I mean what happens to the dogs? How do the dogs yeah how so is the dogs what, welfare what the disease is, yeah. is is that the dog appears to feel um, probably pain certainly uh, discomfort uh, as if uh, flies are landing on it and it it's it's the the most the mildest symptoms that you see are with the dog pawing the air like this. And um, it is feeling some discomfort slightly remote from its own body and trying to scratch away at that discomfort. And then in the most severe cases, you will see the dog collapsed in pain. And this is really a, a very nasty thing for the owner to watch. It's episodic, it's not all the time, but it's a very, very nasty disease. And something which I know Cavalier uh, King Charles owners and breed clubs are very anxious to try and get rid of and, and have been uh, trying to do breeding based on looking at spinal cords for, for some time now. Yeah, I think it's probably something we should emphasise, isn't it, is that there is a great deal of effort going on within the breeds to try and eliminate some of these very breed-specific problems. And where the genetics comes in is identifying the, the right parents Indeed. to... Prefer preferably 
breed from. Quite a lot of the diseases that we see most commonly are ones which don't start until fairly late on in the dog's life. And so, for example, um, although these are not conformational defects, they're complex defects, there are a number of cancers uh, which are associated with particular breeds. Uh, so the Bernese Mountain Dog and the Flat-Coated Retriever, for example, have particularly high levels of cancer. And people are working on the genetics of that disease, but it's, it's proved very complex as it is in humans. Um, those cancers arise when the dog is six, seven, eight, nine years old. Dogs start breeding when they're about two, sometimes a little earlier than that. And so if you've been successful in the show ring, you've already passed your genes on by the time anybody thinks it would be a bad idea to breed from that dog. So this presumably is, a, is an area where modern genetics can have a major impact, is that dogs can be identified literally as puppies, as being suitable for whether, whether or not they fit the breed standard in, the, in their appearance. Some dogs will be identified as more suitable for breeding in terms of not um, carrying these late developing diseases and others will be, um, will, will be the opposite. Indeed, so we already do that with monogenic, as they're called, disorders. And uh, there are websites, including UFOR's uh, genetic website, uh, which list uh, these diseases and say what DNA tests are available. The other thing I should say is that by looking into the uh, genetics of these diseases, we learn a lot about the biology as well. And hopefully this will give us better treatments and less invasive treatments for some of these diseases. The other thing is that there are breeds, the rarer breeds, that are threatened at the moment by their genetic diseases, threatened with, in fact, being entirely eliminated. And I think providing good advice for breeders with those breeds who are interested in those breeds will allow their preservation as healthy populations.